Hi there, my name is Patrick Dempsey, and finally, I am this year's People Magazine Sexiest Man Alive for the next 10 years. I don't know why there should be anybody after me, to be honest with you. So this is it, this is the end of it, and it's good. It's been a great run for people, and congratulations. And I'm glad I could finish it all for you. I was completely shocked. And then I laughed and I was like, you're kidding me. This is a joke, right? I was on a plane heading from New York to, to Maine and we were taxiing out. It was very early in the morning and my phone rang <laughs> and I, I started laughing and I was like, that's too funny. I've been the bridesmaid for People's Sexiest Man Alive uh, 10 times. Now I get the big picture, not the little picture that's on the side. I haven't told the kids or anybody. I think they'll 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 pick on me, <laughs> which is good. They keep me young. I think everybody's going to give me a hard time, which they should. You know, I think it's uh, it's nice to have the recognition. It's fun, but I think you know it's it's good. Yeah. It gives me a platform to actually talk about like the Dempsey Center and the, the type of work that we're doing there. So there, if you can use it for something positive, I think that's good. And certainly, my ego takes a a nice little bump. What was I like as a kid? I was very active. I wasn't someone who liked to sit in the classroom. I struggled academically because of, I, I wasn't diagnosed until probably junior high school that I had dyslexia. So my learning style just did not fit into the form that we have uh, for many people in this country uh, and around the world. So it was always a bit of a struggle. And that sort of wears away at your confidence and self-esteem. And I found other ways through sports uh, and things like that that gave me the confidence um, that I needed because I didn't get it in school. I just, I did, just the approach and, and how they teach was not something that was working for me. I needed to be moving all the time. Uh, a lot of sports, baseball, soccer, skiing, cycling, all those type of things. Uh, classroom situation was never happy. Um, and uh, was really a late bloomer. I was always much smaller than everybody else and late sort of growing and things like that. And, and, and then, you know, I lived in the country. I lived in rural Maine and had an opportunity to just kind of roam around freely without any worries. I could just go off and, and be gone all day long and then come home for dinner. I wanted to be an Olympic skier, a uh, slalom skier. Um, and I was watching Inmar Stenmark, who was the greatest skier of the time. Uh, and still, I think one of the all time greats. And he was doing an up close and personal special on ABC Wide World of Sports. And he was riding the unicycle in his dry land training. And that's how I sort of got inspired to, to purchase a, a unicycle. So I was selling seeds door to door to make enough money to order the unicycle from the Sears and Roebuck catalog. <laughs> I still have the unicycle to this day. Uh, it's a little beat up, but yeah, I can still ride the unicycle, yes. The one that I had then, is a, it's a little beat up. It's welded together, it's like Frankenstein. shop class. Uh, my teacher was Paul McKinney and he was juggling to entertain us because we couldn't work on any of the machines because the power had gone down. And I was like, I'd like to learn how to do that. And then I started picking it up right, right away. And he was in a, a vaudeville troupe called Buckfield Leather and Lather. And they needed a young performer. So they, they were like, hey, you ride the unicycle, you juggle a little bit. Why don't you come in and start performing with us? And then that opened up a whole new door um, for me. Uh, and that, that helped my confidence a lot and certainly the response from the audience. Um, and people are always, you know, very entertained and surprised and, and, and very enthusiastic when you're juggling, so. And then that became my summer job. That became a way of making some money. And then I heard about this talent competition. I ended up putting a three minute juggling routine together. I won locally. I raised enough money from um, people in the village in, in Buckfield uh, uh, to get, uh, a plane ticket and enough money to, to get a hotel room in New York. I flew down on my own and then won that and got an agent. And then four months later, I lied about my age and I was in a Torch Song Trilogy. I auditioned for Harvey Firestein uh, at the Helen Hayes Theater in New York. Got it, dropped out of school and then went to San Francisco to perform that play for three months and then came back to New York. And that's how it all got started. My dad was a big racing fan. 
the ski racing, the speed, the challenges of that, the focus of that, the training, all, all of that started really early on. I started with matchboxes. My dad would always bring a car home on Friday nights. So that's when it started, my love for cars. And then I got away from it and was pursuing a career until I was probably in my mid thirties. And then my, well, Jill, uh, we were just starting the date. My first Christmas present was a three day Skip Barber uh, certificate to go and, and do their training program. And that's where it really started and it started to become more of a reality uh, where like, okay, I could see a path forward doing that. So that's where it all started. I like the camaraderie. I like the fellowship. I like the teamwork. There's an enthusiasm there that's different, that's pure because people are there because they love it. It's a passion. It's certainly uh, challenging mentally and physically, all of those things combined. And then it's really a test with, with oneself of how far you can push yourself. You know, can you get through that corner a little bit faster? I mean, there's so much data now. Uh, and I think because of drive to survive, more and more people are understanding the sport, and especially Formula One. They understand the personalities and the conflict and the dynamics. And it's all those things that I think that are attractive to it as well. And the cars are cool and they're sexy and they're fun. The sound, the smell, all of that. I have a good collection. I have less than I've had in the past, but I'm mostly focused on Porsche right now. But yeah, I have a, a nice collection of cars. They're, they're, they're just, you know, they're work of art. They're a work of art, piece of sculpture that you can interact with. And especially the vintage cars, it really, um, it's a great way to, to drive around and to meet people because you know usually people are very enthusiastic and very positive when they see the car and their eyes light up and they're friendly and then you can you know you take the road rage away and you want to share that with them you know definitely as an ambassador for Porsche and for Tag Heuer you know that's part of your job is to be able to share the car and to engage in a fun way. I don't have a favorite car. I think the most important car though was after I did a movie I bought my first car as an adult, which was a 1963 356 Cabriolet. I still have that car today. And that was a very special moment to have that car, yeah. And it's still fun to drive, you know. I've been tracking this movie for years. Uh, I think Mike was, have been, has been trying to make the movie for over 30 years. And I started following about 15 years ago. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna go after this. I wanna be a part of it. I love this script. I love this period in, in motorsport history. I love Michael Mann as a director. And I picked up the phone and I called him and I go, look, I want a meeting with you. I'd like to come in and discuss being a part of the movie. And you know, he, he said, sure, come in, let's sit down and talk. And we've been friends. We've been talking you know, at different car events and things like that here in, in, in and around uh, California. Uh, and that taught me a lesson of like, aha, you know what? If you really want something, you gotta pick up the phone and do it yourself. And I should have known that prior to you know, this point in my life, but there was something empowering about that. And, and I think that's something that I need to remember to do more often. We should have probably done a wake for it, but they ended up dyeing my hair and it took, I think seven or eight attempts. <laughs> my, my scalp was just fried. And then towards the end of the shoot, because I had a helmet on, I got what is called a chemical cut. So the hair was just so fragile, it just started breaking off. So I was almost like a monk because I just had this circle of broken hair. And then we had to shave it all off because it was too much. But what you do for your art, right? Yeah, I mean, this is a great platform to be able to talk about what we do at the Dempsey Center. And what we do is we help people who have been impacted by cancer. We don't treat the disease, we treat the person in what is called wraparound care. Um, a lot of counseling, acupuncture, Reiki, nutrition, uh, youth and family where we take care of the caregivers. I think a lot of people forget about that, how difficult it is to, to be there and be supportive for someone who you love deeply, who's been impacted by cancer. So we try to take care of the entire family or the entire group. Uh, and I think this should be standard care uh, around the world. Uh, and it's shocking that it isn't. So we wanna bring more awareness to that type of approach because we, we we treat the disease, but we don't heal the person. And I think this is something we need to focus on as well. You'll have a better outcome in the long run uh, in the type of work that we're doing at the center. Our goal is to reach everybody who's newly impacted in the state of Maine, and then just really spread the word throughout the rest of the nation and around the world. And to get people, as soon as they're diagnosed, to have this type of support, uh, that moment that horrible information comes into one's family. She was diagnosed in 1997 and had, uh, over the next 17 years, 12 reoccurrences. 
Um, but one of the things that kept her going was going into the center because we founded it in 2008, is she, she would come in and talk to people who were newly diagnosed. And it allowed her, I think, uh, a little bit more care for herself for not feeling, she felt guilty that she survived. With so many people that she had treatment with didn't. And by being a mentor, being there for someone who's newly diagnosed, there was a, a lot of healing between both people in those moments. I think to be of service is really why we're here. And I think you really feel that when you're doing this type of work. And, and when I'm at the center, when I'm working with the staff and working with the board, uh, you have that sense of teamwork and then you're working on something that has great meaning. And everyone in that room has been impacted on some level. Uh, and you're coming from that place. Then it, it, being able to do stuff like this is fun and you don't take it seriously because it, you can, it gives you the platform to be able to bring that kind of light to that cause. What would I say that I love most about my relationship? I think that we just have a wonderful way to communicate. You know, we have a good sense of humor with each other. And I like her humor. And she's really hardworking, you know. <laughs> she's always inspired me to keep going and working hard. And she's constantly creating something, that, which is really nice to see. I knew the moment I saw her. I went in where she was working at the time and I looked across the room and I could see her and I was blown away and I just had that feeling. And it was, I think it was four or five years later that we actually had our first date. We're complete opposites. And I have to say, she'll make me do shit that I never want to do. And nine times out of 10, she's absolutely correct. But I go bitch, moan and gripe until I get it over with. And I'm like, you know, you were right. So she puts up with me. If we can get a date night, that's great. I find it uh, with the kids and the schedules, it's, it's much harder to take the time to do that. But when you have gigs like this or a job, you know, then that's kind of like a date night in a way where we're, you know, we have time driving to the location where we can talk and then um, discuss things without any distractions. Or even when uh, doing the grooming and things like that, I mean, that's an opportunity for us to, to talk without distractions. They're all like me in, in bits and pieces and they're all like their mother in bits and pieces. And that's good. They all have unique qualities and they have their own goals that they need to, to develop and harvest themselves. And we just try to model our behavior and hopefully they'll pick up on that. Um, they're all athletic, they like to move. They're all very disciplined on that. And you just try to instill the right values and, and hopefully they have the right manners. And you know, when they come back in and other parents go, hey, your children are very polite. And you're like, oh, that's nice to hear. But, you know, it's very challenging having your children grow up in Hollywood. And, to be in that environment. I just read something about, you know, how important it is when you you have children, what, what is the, the environment that they're in will be the most important thing for them and their development. So trying to keep that a good, calm, loving, safe environment for them. Well, teenage boys who keep me very active and, you know, I need to stay in shape to keep up with them. So they're, they're all me about my diet, about am I training enough, am I working hard enough? So I, they're very good for me and I appreciate that. Uh, and they challenge me. And you just want to stay active. I mean, the older you get, the, the more work you have to put into just, you know, starting at the baseline you had when you're in your 20s. And psychologically, it's really good for you. And I want to be active. I want to be able to move around and feel much better that way. So I get up in the morning, I do my workout in the gym at the house. Uh, and then I'll play some tennis or something with the kids or do some cycling and, and try to stay active. My daughter's a great pastry chef, so she's always experimenting. So I'm always eating that. So that's my weakness is bread products and sweets. I'm just trying to be supportive to my daughter who's creating these wonderful pastries. And it's important that I embrace that and eat them. But that is definitely my weakness. Just, I love it. That's, that's the biggest thing. And my son's constantly yelling at me. They're much more disciplined than I am. I just try to be a better person every day, you know, and, and, and try to be present if I can. And, and be there and to listen to what the needs are of the family and be able to provide from that perspective. And then, you know, you get feedback from them on how you can improve as being a father or being a husband. What would you say is one of the happiest moments of your life? This moment right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say aside from today. <laughs> happiest moments, I think, it's just, you know, when we're together as a family and we're all laughing and getting along and having fun. Those are the, those are the greatest moments. That doesn't happen long, but it's fun when it does. I think the next chapter right now is like what we want to do and where we want to live and what we want to explore and travel a little bit. 
So we've been talking a lot about that more and more because the, the boys are getting to a point where they'll be out of the house, maybe. <laughs> If anybody leaves the house anymore these days, I think it's interesting. But uh, yeah, just the next chapter. <laughs>